Okay, now I want to focus on the idea of instantaneous rate of change. The important thing that you need to understand about instantaneous rate of change is that you are not going to be able to calculate the exact instantaneous rate of change. The only thing you're going to be able to do is to make an estimation. Okay? We have an entire year of calculus in which we're going to learn how to find an actual instantaneous rate of change. First of all, you have to understand what the instantaneous rate of change is. For finding the average rate of change, what we're really doing was taking the entire interval and looking at what happened across an entire period of time. Even though the ball that I had thrown was slowing down, on average, it was traveling about 20 feet per second. It started out faster, it ended up getting slower than that at some point. Instantaneous rate of change is a little bit different. Basically, we want to find out how fast the ball is moving at some split second in time. If you want to make a comparison, a good comparison would be driving a car. If you're driving a car, you start out at zero, zero miles per hour and you speed up to 50 miles per hour. You hit all kinds of different speeds in between those two. The instantaneous rate of change would be at whatever split second you look at the speedometer on your car. Okay, maybe it says 47 miles per hour at that instant in time. That's your instantaneous rate of change. You can see that word instant in there. Okay? It's if you take a snapshot photo at that moment in time, what's happening? Well, we don't have enough data here to be able to figure out what's happening, happening in any exact moment in time. The only thing you're going to be able to do is to make an estimation. Okay? For example, instead of using the entire interval, I could pick data that's a little bit closer to the actual moment in time that we want to calculate a rate of change for. For example, if I want to calculate an instantaneous rate of change at eight seconds, I could use data around the eight second point in this ball's path that it's traveling, okay? So, same thing. We want to know how many feet per second this is moving. We want to know the change in feet compared to the change in seconds. And instead, I'm going to zero in on a smaller part of the graph. I'm going to look at just these two pieces of data right here the last two, the two that are closest together. And they're going to give me a much better snapshot than looking at the entire path this thing is covered. Okay? So, I want to find my change in feet over my change in time. In this case, it ends up at 160. It had started at 140 in this much more small, specific interval that we're looking at. The time started out at 6 seconds, ended at 8. We can subtract those two. And the conclusion that I'm going to come to here is that this ball moved 20 feet in two seconds. Okay? In other words, it was traveling approximately 10 feet per second by the time that we quit collecting data, perhaps by the time that it was caught. Now, is that the best instantaneous rate of change I can find? No. It would be even better if I had data that was even closer to that 160, okay, either a little bit past the 160 or a little bit before the 160, just depending on what you have. It doesn't matter if you go above or below, but you want information that is as close to that eight second point in time as you can possibly get, okay? Um, so I'm going to pause here and I'm going to look at a slightly different scenario that allows us to narrow in just a little bit and get an even better snapshot. But again, you have to keep in mind these are estimates. Until we learn how to do real calculus, we're not going to be able to find the actual instantaneous rate of change. Okay, you'll see on my table that I've changed the information just a little bit. I've added in an additional data point here. And once again, I'm trying to find an instantaneous rate of change, but I'm trying to narrow in. Okay, before, the only information that I had that was close to that eight second point was 140 feet after six seconds. It was the closest that I could get to that other point in time, which really wasn't very close. Okay, there was still a pretty large interval there. Uh, now you'll see that I've narrowed everything down quite a bit. Um, my new piece of data was taken after 8.1 seconds. So as it's passing that eight second mark, I have an additional piece of data, and I know that that had traveled 160.5 feet at that point in time, okay? The calculation process is exactly the same as it was before. All I have to do is find my change in 
distance over my change in time. In this case, my change in distance is going to be 160.5 minus 160. On the bottom, the change in time, 8.1 minus 8. That's the interval there, the change. So what do I find out? Well, very simple. I find out that the ball traveled 0.5 feet in 0.1 seconds. And if you divide that out, you find out that real close to 8 seconds, just a tenth of a second past 8 seconds, this was traveling only at 5 feet per second. It had continued to slow down. So if you think back to the original problem, this original ball, when we found the average rate of change, the average velocity, if you want to think of it in that sense, it was moving at 20 feet per second on average over the course of that whole interval. Okay? Now as we're picking data points that are closer and closer and closer to that end point where the ball stops or where it's caught or at least where we're trying to make our calculation, now we're finding that this thing has slowed down a whole lot. Okay? Now, is that the exact instantaneous rate of change? No. I can keep getting closer. I can keep zeroing in. It just depends on what data I've been given. Okay? I'll do one more example to show you what that might look like. All right, I got my last example here. I'll take down the calculation from before. And you'll notice now that I have a piece of data in which I'm told that 8.01 seconds my ball had traveled 160.04 feet. Okay? At this point, same thing as before. I just need to find out how much the distance changed over that interval of time, over a certain amount of time. So my change in distance, 160.04 minus the 160 that had been at before, divided by the change in time, 8.01 minus 8 ends up giving me 0 0.04 feet that this ball changed in a period of 0 0.01 seconds. If you simplify that down, decimal moves two places, you find out that this was traveling 4 feet per second right at about the point at which it was caught. Okay? So all I'm doing here is continuing to get closer and closer and closer to that 8 seconds. Now, there's no reason I have to go past 8 seconds. If the ball gets caught at 8 seconds, you're not going to have any data that comes after that eight second point. So you might have information at 7.9 seconds or 7.99 seconds and you can go the other direction. Okay? As long as you have data that's close to the point that you're trying to calculate an instantaneous rate of change for, you're going to be able to make that calculation. So that's the difference between instantaneous rate of change, finding the rate of change, or in this case the velocity, at a single instant in time, in our case Currently, we're only able to make an estimation in comparison to finding an average rate of change over an entire interval. Hopefully, that's been helpful to you.